appreciate the intro. So folks, we are very excited to be here to talk about building simplified service mesh API for developers. And with that, uh, we're going to dive into the content. Uh, so we're going to start with why to explain what problems we are trying to solve. Then we're also going to explain the approaches to solve the problem. Uh, in fact, we're going to talk about Salesforce from what we learned um, at IstioCon last year, and also Splunk, what we learned yesterday at IstioCon. And then Ying is going to take us through the Airbnb story, and I'm also going to take us through the Solos approach. I'd like to uh, have in to talk about why. Yeah. Thanks, Ling. Um, so to begin with, I'd like to share some stats. So at Airbnb, we are running uh, eStudD in a dedicated uh, external cluster. And as of today, we have more than uh, 30 remote workload clusters, powering more than 1,000 services and 20,000 pods. These are just uh, Kubernetes services. We also have a bunch of uh, EC2 services and many um, external services like databases, caches on AWS, um, which are also included in our service mesh. Um, to find out to find out more about our um, Istio setup, check out our um, Istio Count talk last year. So with all these numbers, um, I want to emphasize that we have a lot of uh, users um, to support. Uh, so it's very important. Uh, for us to have a user-friendly API. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So uh, one of the pain points for onboarding uh, Airbnb onto Istio is that the Istio API is complex and uh, keeps evolving. There are many uh, custom resources. It's um, kind of unrealistic to expect all our uh, users to learn um, and some of the features are also not useful for most of our product engineers. And also, if the API keeps evolving, it will be very uh, messy and dangerous if our users need to handle upgrading those APIs uh, by themselves. Um, next slide, please. So um, instead of asking all the teams to learn and manage those uh, custom resources, we believe that providing a simplified, opinionated, and user-friendly API for our Airbnb uh, mesh users is critical. Yeah, that's the Airbnb story. Um, then you want to share? Yeah, that's thoughts. great. Thank you, Ying, and uh, thank you for the entire Airbnb community. I know you guys have been a strong supporter of the Istio project that uh, you've been speak very vocally about your adoption in Istio and inspired many of our users too. With that, I'm going to uh, talk through um, what we learned working with many of our customers adopting Istio in their environment. So what customers have been communicating to us is when they start to adopting service mesh like Istio, they start to think about the teams because it's at the end of the day it's people the teams who is actually doing the work right so the teams they have the admin admin team they have the operator team and then they have the service owner which typically owns one or more services some of them are service producers some of them are service consumers um, and uh, as the service team looking at deploy their services, uh, they are looking at deploying these into Kubernetes, they are looking at deploy VMs, they are looking at the relationship between their services who is consume what and who is allowed to consume what. So these are the things our service team, uh, the, as they're looking at a, a service mesh, what they most are concerned about, about adopting service mesh to their organization. So using a simple, really, really simple example in this case is typically a gateway team would be responsible of management of the gateway infrastructure and configuration of the gateway, such as a host name, a port number, you know, the secrets, the keys for the gateway, whether the gateway should be configured as um, terminated 
information or pass through, and then the service owner would be producing their services such as web API uh, recommendation service in this diagram, and uh, some of the services are exposed on the gateway so that uh, the, the clients outside of the cluster can access. Some of the service, uh, in addition to expose on the gateway, they're also exposed to internal service. For example, in this case, the recommendation service are also exposed to the web API service. So those dependencies are super important to our user as they adopt their services in the mesh. So with Istio, um, they could config a uh, gateway resource, virtual service resource to config route configuration. So this is relative straightforward. But the, the moment they apply this teaming concept into Istio, they tend to find out, OK, in addition to that, I need to add my Istio auth uh, Z policy, make sure you know all the, the relevant services that's allowed to access me can access me. OK, I need to apply the sidecar resource, making sure the Istio um, Envoy sidecar proxy has only the, re the necessary configuration. Oh, by the way, I, as a service producer, I need to add export to to my virtual service. So my virtual service is only visible to the right team uh, that needs to see my virtual service. So there's a few humps the user kind of to get through uh, with the right configuration. So I'd like to run a fun quiz time for our audience um, just to see, you know, if you guys know the answer to this, for for instance, if you need to config HTTP retry and timeout, which is your resource would that be? If you need to config a TCP connect timeout and the keep alive timeout, which resource would that be? What about our liar detections? And also, what what if you need rate limiting for your service or maybe for a particular route? How do you do that with Istio? So this comes to us is how do you make this simple for our user, right? Um, how does user keep track of the Istio API that Ian was describing was com complex and it was evolving very fast? Um, with that, um, I want to summarize uh, some of the work uh, done by Salesforce, which they presented last year at IstioCon, which was pretty interesting. So the way they did it was they produced uh, open source Istio optimized Helm starter, um, which is the uh, the repo um, down below under the Salesforce organization. So in this Helm starter, they kind of produce a couple of uh, configurations. Uh, one for mesh service uh, for, I think these are typically everything you need for running a services in the mesh and ingress services for services you need to expose outside of the mesh and also egress and OS policy. What's interesting of this approach is through Helm configuration, um, they hide the Istio resources for their user. So their user would only focus on changing values.yaml file um, to be able to onboarding a services to the mesh or connect their services to Istio ingress gateway, for example. So it's a pretty interesting approach. So if you're interested to learn more, definitely check out the repository. Uh, the other thing is I just learned this yesterday from Splunk. Uh, well, um, Bernard was talking about building a service abstraction layer at Splunk where they hide the complexity of virtual services, destination rule, and gateway service entry customer resources for their user. So, um, and cover 80% of their scenario. So that was an interesting approach uh, from their side too. With that, I'm going to transition to in to talk about Airbnb. Yeah, thanks. Um, so Airbnb has a similar um, story. So um, we also have an abstraction layer. So at Airbnb, each service has uh, this underscore infra folder where um, people define everything about the service like Kubernetes deployment information, secret management, uh, automated testing, and extra. Um, and as part of it, we added the mesh YAML file 
where users define the service mesh um, settings. So instead of directly uh, interacting with uh, Istio customer resources, our engineers only need to work with uh, this simple config file. Uh, next slide, please. So Mesh YAML follows our Air Mesh API, which I will uh, dive deeper later. Um, for example, here, um, as you can see, is a mesh configuration file for um, the banana service. Um, so service owners checking this mesh YAML file alongside with their uh, service code after code review. And then um, next slide, uh, during CI time, we uh, validate mesh YAML and then we generate Istio customer resources from this mesh YAML file. So at this step, we convert from our Air Mesh API to the Istio API. Um, next slide. Um, and then the generated Istio resources are stored and users can then deploy those configs uh, by using our deployment system. Um, this whole step is um, abstracted away from our users so they don't need to know about uh, the Istio customer sources. Yeah, now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about Air Mesh API. So one of the main difference between uh, Istio API and Air Mesh API is that Istio API is feature-based, as Lin just um, described, like um, multiple customer sources are required to define the different features of a single workload, for example, uh, the retry and timeout settings uh, is in the virtual service. The connection pool settings is in the destination rule and the, the OSDE related settings are in the OSDE policy. Um, so on the other hand, our Air Mesh API is a uh, workload based. We, def we provide different types of so-called mesh objects. So to configure a mesh object, all settings are defined on that single mesh object itself. Um, next slide, please. Um, we provide several different types of mesh objects. We provide app, which are just a uh, workload that only have outgoing traffic. And then we have the service, which is the most common type of workload. We also have VM app and VM service. Uh, that's the uh, VM version of app and service. And the external is used for um, defining external services into the mesh, like our um, MySQL databases on AWS. Um, yeah, and that I like to show example of a service mesh object. As you can see here, the type specifies that it's a service mesh object, and that under the service, users can define what are the dependencies of this service. And then we also have a ports section. And for each port, user can specify um, the allow list, the OSD, the connection pool settings, um, the outlier detection, and the timeout and the retries and extra, extra. Um, yeah, next slide. Um, here is another example of an external service. Um, so it has a port section similar to the service uh, type mesh object. And then the difference is that it has an endpoint section where um, people list out the individual endpoints of this uh, external service. Yeah, that's um, that's the two examples. Um, next slide. Um, and then we discover a problem is that um, sometimes the mesh YAML file becomes very verbose. So in, in, uh, in order to uh, reduce verbosity, we also allow uh, extension and override uh, between different mesh objects. And I will show you some examples. So here, um, banana canary and banana canary baseline both extend uh, the banana production uh, mesh object. So they get the same configuration as uh, production in this example. Uh, this greatly reduces the verbosity of this mesh config file. And sometimes, um, next slide, um, most of the settings are the same, but uh, with a few exceptions. So user can also uh, use extension uh, with override. So only um, all the settings ex except the overridden uh, fields are the same. 
Yeah, um, next slide. Um, we also support different kinds of traffic routing. Uh, one of the most common one at Airbnb is uh, ACA, meaning automated canary analysis. So ACA is like a deployment strategy. At a very high level, it lets you uh, partially, partially roll out a change um, to like the canary uh, environment and then evaluate it against the current deployment to uh, assess its performance. So this requires us to uh, modify traffic routing dynamically during uh, deployment time. And uh, here's how we um, achieve this. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so in the deployment config, user uh, will define the mesh object keys that they want to conduct ACA on, um, on the top right corner the red, uh, red um, uh, so here, for example, um, our uh, the override key is banana production. So they want to uh, conduct AC on banana production with the canary and baseline key also specified. And then our deployment system will automatically uh, generate the Istio virtual service based on the user input and our mesh uh, YAML file. And then this virtual service uh, will be deployed during the apply routing stage in our deploy pipeline. And then the traffic routing um, is uh, done. And then our tooling will also generate the uh, virtual service to restore back the traffic and uh, apply it after the ACA is finished. So um, the virtual service is hidden away uh, from user um, again. And so all they need to configure is um, the deployment config file on the uh, top uh, right. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's all I have for Airbnb. Yeah, that's great. And you know, I can tell from the example you are showing that your user can totally focus on their workloads and uh, you know not to learn any of the Istio API with the YAML you were presenting. So very cool. So with that, um, I'm going to dive into um, how Solo is building abstraction on top of Istio service mesh. So when we start to looking at uh, working with our customers, we, we start to looking at uh, the fundamentals of service mesh, and we come to realize there are three key components as part of the service mesh. Uh, one is uh, routing, how the traffic goes, right? How do we enable um, the source to reach the destination? And the other thing is policy. How do we control the communication between services. And the third one is admin. How can we um, onboarding teams uh, and what can teams do what? Uh, so those are the three key fundamentals as we think about service mesh adoptions. Um, so with uh, listening to many of our users, we find out uh, like I mentioned earlier, users have multiple teams, uh, they have their services. So multi-tenancy and isolation are extremely important to our teams. Um, the application-centric approach, uh, like Inwards mentioned, the user can focus on their application. Um, is super important to our users so they don't have to worry too much about like cluster, you know, nitty gritty infrastructure information. They focus more on their workloads and uh, their services. Um, what we also learned from our user, uh, especially the service owner, they don't want to learn any of the resources, um, particular any of the complicated resources that's faster changing. What they've told us is that they understand how to use Kubernetes labels and uh, you know if anything can be solved by label you know that they're willing to learn labels but with you know beyond that you know they really want to keep the learning to a very minimum and also uh, we've learned a lot from our admins uh, the, the the team doing admin and operator they tend to wants to delegate their responsibilities as much as possible to other teams, which could be service teams, um, so that they don't have to own everything. 
So a first concept we introduce uh, is a concept called workspace. It's a logic boundary for the team that enables us to provide fundamental uh, for multi-tendencies. So the way to think about our workspace is each team, they would have their own workspace and then they can deploy their services inside of their workspace. They can put their uh, customer resource also in that uh, workspace. And what's interesting about this approach is uh, the the admin, as they create the workspace, they can define you know which cluster are part of the workspace, but the the detail of the cluster information could be hidden from the application developer who are focusing on service delivery. So, for instance, in this case, uh, Pam is a administrator role, mesh admin, where she could onboard in different teams uh, using this workspace concept. Where she could say, "This team is in charge of this whole cluster, and this team could be maybe one particular namespace inside of this cluster." And and the other team, Web API team, could be a dynamic team as soon as more cluster joins that has this particular label, you know, this workspace is going to grow automatically as the cluster um, grows. So if we reuse the particular example that we were talking about earlier, uh, in this case, uh, you could have, uh, let's see, so if we reuse the particular example, our web API consumes a recommendation service and the, they both are exposed to the Istio ingress gateway. Uh, another abstraction we introduce for this is uh, virtual destination. And the reason we introduce that resource is uh, if you look at uh, uh, running your services in single cluster, right? In this diagram, every single service is on one cluster, it's actually pretty simple and straightforward, but the moment you actually start to want to have higher availability for every single uh, services running across different cluster, what if well, you know, Web API dies in cluster one, but still available in cluster two, but maybe recommendation is in cluster one, but not in cluster two. So a concept called global host name uh, is being introduced by um, by many of the users in the community, that essentially means regardless where my client is, you know, I always want them to call by this particular global host name. In this case, we give an example called recommendation that is still in action.io. So even though I'm a client outside of the mesh or I'm a client inside of the mesh, I can always call it recommendation that is still in action that I owe. And regardless which cluster I'm running my client. So if I'm running on the local cluster, same as the destination, you know, we can do the routing if I'm running on a different cluster. Uh, you know, this virtual destination abstraction provides uh, that abstraction for our user so the user doesn't have to think out, you know, how am I going to create this virtual service? How am I going to create this um, destination rule, service entry, or maybe workload entry, you know, whatever is needed, uh, the virtual destination will base on the deployment context of these services and then think out the underlying Istio resources for a user and deploy that for them. The other concept we have is policies, uh, where we build uh, actually a policy that's kind of a microservice-based policy. And the reason I say that is we actually created a lot of policy, like the retry timeout example, you know, that's one policy. Rain emitting is another policy. The way we envision how policy works is you can have a policy that's very functional based and then the admin or the operator can create like rain emitting um, 100 requests per second as a policy. And then as a developer, you can choose to associate how you want to apply your policy by labels. So let me give an example. For, for instance, this is a simple access policy to enable uh, strict mutual TLS. And, uh, you know, I can say this access policy, maybe it's only, uh, it's a, apply to this app recommendation. So whichever app that has this particular label app recommendation, it's going to pick up this policy automatically. 
The other example I can give is a rain emitting policy. In this case, we're saying, you know, I'm creating a 100 requests per minute as a rain emitting policy applied to routes. So in order for a route to pick up, it's just really simple. You just add this label of uh, rain emitting 100 requests per minute that uh, would pick up uh, this particular rain emitting on this particular route. So with that, I'm going to pass it to Ian to uh, do the conclusion. Yeah, so um, we believe that a, a simplified and opinionated and user-friendly API that uh, suits your company's specific needs, um, that hides away the complexity and uh, uh, evolving, um, a feature, uh, evolving um, nature of the Istio API will greatly help uh, with the Istio adoption. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, thank you, Ying. I would add um, that service owner, you know, typically doesn't want to learn another set of CRDs. They want to really minimize their learnings um, as much as possible. Uh, if you are interested in, you know, the abstraction we're building at Solo, we do run a workshop this Thursday. So feel free to join us to experience a little bit hands on on the abstraction we build. With that, I think we are available to take any questions you guys may have. By the way, I want to give a shout out to Im. She is the most uh, delegated speaker I've ever seen because every time I work with her on the slides, she was unfortunately on medical leave and she still you know, pulled out the time for me and for Istio Khan and built the great slides for us. So thank you so much, Im. Thank you, it's an honor. Thank you.